Hello and welcome everybody to the second day of the MARI Conference Global 2022. Um, the next session here will be about building your own email delivery infrastructure. We have two guests, Martin, who is a founding member of Postmastery. Um, they are helping senders with on-premise email infrastructure, uh, also email service providers, marketing agencies, and large media senders. And we will also have Jakob from Czech Republic, um, who is a CEO of MailKit, which is a marketing platform, and Omniberry, which is an API sending infrastructure. So we're going to go down in the in the email deliverability and email sending uh, rabbit hole infrastructure building. Uh, this is a pre-recorded uh, uh, session. So you will have some polls. You can access them in the poll tab up there. If you have questions during the, the video play, please drop them in. And after the video has finished, the presenters will come to the stage and answer your questions. OK, so let's start this. Hi, I'm Jacob Alexa from MailKit and Omniberry. We are an ESP out of Czech Republic. We provide two distinct services. One is a full service ESP uh, platform uh, for email marketing. The second is a sending infrastructure platform. Uh, today, we will be talking about building your email infrastructure for Modic. With me here is my colleague, Martin Ollering. Hello, I'm Martin Ollering. Uh, I'm founding partner of Postmastery. And Postmastery is a consulting company helping uh, senders with on-premise uh, infrastructure, uh, setup optimization. Uh, we also provide tooling uh, for delivery monitoring and we provide consulting to help with deliverability optimization and with deliverability management. Two of us work together closely because uh, we as an ESP use the toolings that Postmastery provides. And as you can see, uh, the two, two sides that we represent, uh, me, the ESP side and Martin, the more of an on-premise approach, uh, work together quite often and for good reason. So let's look into what uh, the advantages of ESPs are. First off, you get an all-in-one cost. So you know what, you, what you're going to pay in advance. There is no additional uh, deliverability cost usually because uh, you can or you should be able to rely on your ESP for deliverability consulting and deliverability management. So you don't usually need your own on-premise uh, deliverability specialists and you probably won't be needing anything else but the consulting services of your ESP for that matter. You also have no maintenance costs because ESP will take care of that for you and make sure that you get the, the best possible service at the time. It's also much easier uh, to implement. Uh, the buy-in costs are much, much lower than setting up your own on-premise sending infrastructure. Having said that, not all ESPs are equal. There are, uh, there are quite a few differences uh, and uh, the ESPs uh, have different offerings. So it's very important to look into, uh, look into the options on the market and what is it that, that you need for your services? Uh, Martin, could you tell us about the on-prem advantage? First of all, I think it's good to define the on-premise a bit because uh, on-premise uh, literally means that you have your uh, computers on-prem, so in, within your office or beneath your desk, but that's of course not uh, the reality anymore. So. Um, I think on-premise is really 
when you own your own systems. So when you own your own infrastructure, and that could mean uh, that you have uh, that you're hosting with the hosting provider, that you use co-location, or it could even mean that you're uh, hosting uh, in the cloud. So as long as you own your own systems, then uh, we talk about uh, on-premise. The advantages uh, are that uh, you have complete control over your uh, email delivery, all, all the aspects of email delivery. Um, of course, there uh, you, you need to invest in uh, in 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 uh, in terms of money and effort, uh, and also in terms of operations to to set up your system and to uh, manage them. Um, but uh, uh, on the upside, you get complete control over how you send your emails, uh, how you brand your domains. Uh, uh so the full branding uh you you also have more control over costs so typically um after um a, a somewhat higher uh, first investment uh, your variable costs are not really dependent on email volume alone uh, they are dependent on the scale of your infrastructure and often you can send uh yeah huge amounts of emails with uh, with uh, only a few servers so uh, some uh, some uh, senders they 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 do this for cost reasons uh, but i think uh, cost reasons should not be uh, the only reason because you will uh, also have some effort uh, uh, extra effort uh, when you compare this to an esp solution uh, another advantage is that you, uh, uh, for example, when you have tight uh, security requirements and you don't want to share your data with anyone, uh, for example, if you're a financial or some, some other uh, enterprise with very sensitive data. So, so what, what, what other considerations are there for choosing an ESP? Um, and specifically, uh, when you when you focus on the APIs and everything. So for for Motic integration, I would not look at ESPs that uh, provide the, the the full full blown uh, application user interface and allow you to to manage campaigns, etc. Because you do that uh, in Motic, that what you have Motic for. And I would only consider, of course, uh, API-based uh, uh, sending infrastructures. Now, within these, I think the the most most important uh, consideration should be, uh, of course, deliverability, and that uh, that comes with compliance and what are the compliance standards of that ESP. Obviously, a ESP that has a, a freemium freemium service where you can easily sign up and start sending, it's uh, easy to set up. But the downside is that such an ESP will also have a lot of bad actors on the network because spammers can easily sign up and abuse that service. So. Uh, in my experience, it's uh, that is one of the big differentiators. What what's the the barrier of entry? Because then that would dictate a lot of the compliance policies. And uh, with that, uh, it's not only about how hard they they fight fight the abuse on the onboarding side, but also what uh, what are their compliance mechanisms for following best practices of individual senders of their clients, which will tell you a lot about uh, how the overall deliverability uh, might be because uh, yes, it's easier uh, if you don't have to follow any of these rules. Uh, but that will, of course, affect your deliverability in a big way. So you want to make sure 
that uh, the system you're uh, choosing will help you prevent make any mistakes so that it will it will reject messages that wouldn't align for example instead of sending them and affecting your deliverability i i figure the same same applies for on premise right uh, you have the needs for reputation etc as well right yeah that's exactly true uh, the reputation uh, plays an important role uh, uh, also for on-premise and uh, <clears throat> so um, th that 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 is uh, becomes apparent when choosing a, a hoster for example so there will be hosters that are cheap where you can get a cheap uh, vm a virtual machine uh, and and uh, and and you can uh, use that to to send emails um, but the cheaper the the hoster uh the more often they they have uh, the abuse and and the way that they handle the abuse is of course important so you you want um, you want a hoster that has a a decent uh, or a good reputation and um, in terms of reputation uh, the ips are very important because uh, still a lot of uh, uh, reputation is tied to the ip and um, by uh, the the reason uh, that, uh, is that uh, the the receivers the provide the mailbox providers can really quickly uh, determine whether to accept uh, the emails or not so that's a really efficient way of uh, rejecting uh, the worst of the worst uh, and making a first decision in uh, in what to accept and what not uh, the IPs are, are probably your your most important asset because your reputation is for a large part uh, tied with the IPs. And uh, there's really a, a, a now a trend uh, towards domain reputation, uh, but still IP reputation is, uh, uh, is an important factor. And um, related to the ips uh, you also need to see whether your hoster is able to offer uh, a few of them or, or at least uh, the amount that you uh, think you will need uh, for sending the volume that you that you're that you want to send so you don't need uh, lots of ips uh, but you need uh, uh, if you're if you if you have a mailing list of say uh, a few hundred thousand uh, you, you need uh, a few IPs, and if you have a mailing list of, uh, uh, um, let's say, a million, uh, y yeah, you you probably need about four uh, IPs or something. Of course, um, when you when you found your hoster, then another important consideration is to uh, to get a proper MTA, and an MTA is the software that actually sends the emails, and there. And and there are some important choices to make. So so uh, there is um, basically two flavors. There's the open source MTAs, and there's the commercial MTAs. And the open source MTAs they are free. They are they 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 can be uh, often they they are already on the server uh, installed pre-installed uh, sometimes, uh, like for example Postfix. Um, but uh, bear in mind that these um, MTAs were designed for mostly with a focus on inbound. So they're really good in, in, in uh, filtering emails and, and delivering them to mailboxes and different local destinations. Um, but for sending email, emails, you need, you, need, you need something where, where the... Um, uh, which is really focused on outbound, and that means that uh, that it has um, uh, a good performance. Uh, it has deliverability features, um, and you can control the amount of email being sent to to certain providers, uh, and control connections, and uh, yeah, lots of different uh, uh, you need uh, yeah, lots of different controls there. And the commercial uh, MTAs are 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 fo often focused on that part. So there are uh, uh, examples are, for example, Power MTA, 
uh, Halon, uh, Green Arrow, Mailer Q. These MTAs are really focused on uh, sending a large volume of emails and having lot having uh, controls uh, to uh, yeah to control your deliverability to con to set up your authentication, which is an important requirement uh, nowadays, like uh, SPF, DKIM, uh, DMARC. Yeah, and the IPs are actually very important when you're choosing an ESP as well, because uh, as I mentioned, some uh, ESPs will use parts of Amazon uh, Amazon network, which in turn will affect the reputation of their IP space as well. And uh, not to mention that there's a choice to be done, whether you want to have uh, a dedicated IP or uh, be on a shared IP pool. And again, that is a kind of tricky choice because you might feel like uh, being on a dedicated IP is safer for your reputation because you're not affected by uh, by the third parties as you are on, on a shared IP pool. But uh, in many cases, your, your sending volumes are so low that you simply cannot even warm up uh a dedicated ip let alone two three four and there are big differences between uh mailbox providers as well some prefer a uh, small amount of ips to be sending uh, on behalf of a brand in some cases you need actually multiple ips to be able to get the throughput so it's not always an easy decision uh, to make and whether you're setting up an on-prem or using an ESP, that is something that you need to consult either with, um, with your, um, deliverability specialist or your ESP for that matter. Jacob, we talked about, um, integration, uh, a little bit, uh, in relation to ESPs and, uh, on-premise, um, so, so it's not only about uh, uh, sending those emails. Huh? There's also the bounce management, the complaint management. So, how does that work with an ESP? When when you're uh, when you're uh, sending your emails with an ESP, you you can uh, let's say you 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 have an, an API where you uh, uh, inject your or your feed your emails, and and what happens with these bounces and with complaints? Bounces, uh, feedback loops, uh, and many other uh, types of information that are uh, received after the email was sent, uh, either uh, after it was delivered or not delivered, uh, are important. I in in both esp and on-premise setup those are definitely critical and your esp uh, should uh, be able to properly process these information and feed it back to uh to your system through webhooks right it's um uh, that's the usual setup that where uh, the ESP would, uh, you would set up uh, a webhook URL in your ESP and all these events would be pushed through these webhooks uh, to the, to the uh, sending infrastructure, the, the sending system, whether it's Modic or any other tool for, for that matter. For Modic, we have uh, a native uh, plugin that uh, sets up takes care of all of this, sets up, sets up the webhooks, etc., and makes sure that the information in, is properly transferred back to Modic and that the actual setup on, on, on the Modic side is uh, as easy as possible for the user. Uh, so it's um, really a matter of adding um, an API token and selecting the, the sending domain uh for for uh for your setup and 
we will be automatically pushing uh, the the events into Mari. A large difference between the ESPs in how accurate that information is, because the one part is the actual synchronous uh, communication between between the servers during the SMTP transfer of the message. So whether the message was delivered or not, that's uh, that's quite straightforward. But then there is a big chunk of messages that are bounced asynchronously, so-called remote bounces, where the message is initially delivered, but later on a response uh, about the bounce is sent. The, those are not not a lar the largest percentage of bounces is the is the, the synchronous ones the the, the ones that happen uh, during delivery and not after a successful delivery. Uh, but you need to receive those uh, remote bounces and you need to uh, classify them uh, and you yeah you need to act uh, on them. And uh, how, how that, that can be done uh, quite easily is, by, for example, by setting up a mailbox. So setting up a mailbox with IMAP uh, access and, and, and Multic uh, is able to read uh, bounces from an IMAP uh, mailbox. Uh, then uh, Multic uh, will be responsible for, for, for decoding and classifying the bounces. With a somewhat smarter setup, you can avoid uh, having to decode the whole uh, bounce email because the bounce information is already somewhere in the logs of the MTA. Uh, so if you have an on-premise MTA, it's um, a, a bit smarter to to uh, process the, uh, the bounces from the logs. And some MTAs, like for example, PowerMTA, are able to uh, pro to also decode and classify uh, remote or asynchronous bounces, and that and and that information from these bounces is presented in a structured way in in logs. Uh, it can be uh, uh, CSV format or JSON format. Uh, only. Um, with some ESPs, they do the suppression also. So they, even if you don't uh, process the bounces, they will do it for you and they will suppress them in future mailings. Um, uh, but if you have your on-premise system, uh, it's your responsibility to do that. So it's very important uh, to, to, to really uh, get that bounce information, get the complaint information, uh, because if you uh, start sending uh, uh, repeated emails to someone who complained before, uh, yeah, your your reputation will get a serious uh, hit. And if you don't process bounces, you you could even end up sending to spam traps, and that's also how you can end up uh, on an uh, on a on a block list. So. Uh, that, that that's why uh, uh, bounce processing and complaint processing is very important. Could you set uh, set a scale for when does a customer need an on-premise setup? Is it you know when you send um, five million messages a month? Is it when you have? Um, a list of a specific size. When should I go start and build my own infrastructure on prem? Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, volume, uh, and and that's a, that's an important uh, uh, aspect. So uh, you can imagine that if your volume is really low, uh, you you probably don't. Uh, you, you can't justify the cost for for setting up your own infrastructure because you probably need to uh, to get some uh, yeah some some uh, infrastructure some servers uh, you you need to uh, uh, spend some effort in setting these up uh, if you um, uh, uh, you need to uh, if you buy a, a commercial MTA you need to pay for the license. Uh, which is often uh, yeah 
a fixed amount or or maybe a yearly amount um that means that that you need to send uh, a certain amount of volume uh, to justify these uh, fixed uh, costs these setup costs and um, yeah it, it really depends on uh, on how you do this and what what kind of uh, system you you are setting up but uh, we we always we always we use a ballpark figure like okay uh, maybe let's say 1 million a month um uh, if you if you send less than 1 million a month uh, you probably shouldn't uh, go for on premise yeah and that in the end definitely affects the uh deliverability right if if you if you go with an on prem and you don't have the volume and you go with uh um an open source setup uh which will be cheap of course but uh it will affect deliverability, right? You you need to be able to somehow measure that. So that's another cost. Or you can uh, you can uh, work with uh, a third party consultant uh, like Post Mastery. But how how does how does that play together, or how does that affect the decision to go um, into on prem solution? yeah well the 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 it it affects it in a way that you you need to uh, you need to be uh, you need to want to own your own deliverability so you want to take ownership of that um and and whether you do it yourself or whether you you use a consultant uh, that that's uh uh, that's another question but uh, in the end uh, it's your system and and you're 100 percent accountable for for what happens on that system so that means that you own your deliverability um and uh, it uh, so having on-prem gives you great uh, uh, control because you have full control but it also uh, with control comes responsibility, I would say. So uh... it's the same for us as an ESP. We have the control and we feel the responsibility for deliverability. Of course, uh, deliverability is not only about IP reputation, but content is the king. So a lot of that is affected by content. But we do the analysis, we dig through the numbers. If if our customers are telling us we are seeing this drop, we want to investigate what is the actual cause of that drop. Is it is it a URL that was used in, in the content of an email that uh, had, a, had been blacklisted? Or is it uh, an IP address reputation issue? Is it our problem? Is it is, is the problem on our side? Is it that we have uh, allowed something uh, something toxic to, to come out of our, our IP space and affected our uh, IP reputation? Or is it the content? Or it could be as remote as uh, misconfiguration on, on, on another MTA serving that specific domain that led to uh, led to a decrease in the domain reputation. So there are many factors, and we look into all of those to figure out what is the the real reason behind uh, behind any issues. And as I said, there might be many, but it's always important to to find the root cause. So. Um uh and jacob we talked about uh, esps uh, 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 and on-premise uh, to summarize um, can you give us a, a few uh, one-liners uh, when you need to choose for an esp i would say if if you want uh, a hassle-free managed service with uh set of features that you need, that you don't want to build, uh, that you need, uh, you don't want to invest 
into your own deliverability team and you just want to have a reliable partner because ESP will, will be just that. We take all ESPs, uh, make sure they have redundant systems, they have uh, deliverability specialists to monitor the networks, they will have robust APIs, robust systems, uh, pretty much everything will be set up so it's as easy for customers to start sending. What's the selling point of on-prem? So the one, one main reason is um, when you have very tight uh, data security requirements, so you don't want to share your data with anyone. Uh, you already have a large, uh, maybe a large uh, system uh, uh, which you own uh, and you, you want to, uh, uh, to have email delivery uh, be part of that system. So you can imagine that this is important for uh, financials or, or, or other enterprises um, uh, which have really strict uh, uh, security or strict uh, privacy requirements. Uh, then um, another reason uh, uh, is that um, uh, is for senders that want to control every aspect of the email delivery process. So they want to control uh, how the branding is done on every level of the emails. So um, they want to... Uh, uh, they they like uh, being in control and they they are uh, interested in deliverability um so they they are not afraid uh for the uh, for the work that comes with that uh or they uh, uh they, they um, yeah they they can of course also hire uh, uh, consultants or or uh, people to help them with uh, either the technical side or with the more uh, deliverability side uh, to 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 manage there is tooling uh, also available um, so i think those are the main reasons uh, sometimes i always say yeah some people say on premise uh, can be cheaper uh, and and many senders they consider uh, sending on prem because uh, they think it's cheaper. Um, maybe it is, uh, or maybe it isn't. I think it really depends on uh, uh, how you compare and, and what kind of costs you are including in your calculations. So uh, I think it can be cheaper, especially when you are a really large uh, sender, uh, because most are the costs with on-premise are uh, upfront and they are fixed. And that gives us a very nice conclusion. If you uh, want to make a decision, if you want, if you need to use an ESP or on-premise solution, then you have so many questions to ask yourself. Is it is it just the cost? Is it going to be cheaper or not? Maybe it's going to be more expensive. Is ESP? Uh, going to give you a better performance than than on-premise solution. Is there parts of in existing infrastructure that you can use and uh, have an on-premise setup? Or will you have multiple systems being able to take advantage of the on-premise setup or the ESP? So uh, there is no clear and simple answer it's going to be multiple uh, multiple uh, aspects that you need to look into uh, to make your choice. And you should always be re ready to reconsider this. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for, for this session. And we're, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Well said, Jacob. Uh, thank you for watching our presentation and uh, looking forward to the questions in the Q&A. Well, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. Um, 
Uh, and right now, we don't have any questions at this point. I did <clears throat> write together a couple of questions. I, I wanted to say one more thing, uh, first of all, that I think it's amazing that you guys are investigating on behalf of the customer. I think this is really what's missing from, from other commercial uh, providers. And I know that many of the Modic users are using uh, Amazon SES, which you also mentioned that uh, it's very good if there's a high bar for, for qualifying to be able to send uh, through an ASP. I think Amazon has also uh, a very high bar uh, for that, but the investigation part is completely missing. So when you start not to inbox, you you are out of luck and there is no clue. <clears throat> so I think it's amazing you guys doing that. Um, <clears throat> uh, where can people find you? Um, and also where can Mautic users find that plugin? So we have published the, the plugin on GitHub just last week, and we have uh, submitted it to be to be listed in the in the marketplace. So hopefully soon it will be uh, it will be in the marketplace, making it much easier to install. And we are definitely uh, working on uh, getting it into Modic Five once it gets released, or possibly get it. Uh, uh, get support for Omniberry um, embedded into um, Modic 5. Okay. Another question came up is that um, you were mentioning that IP, bad IP reputation is a number one blocker. And that's like the first thing to watch out for that your IPs are not having a bad reputation, not toxic or not bad. Um, and I participated in a couple of discussions where IP6 came into the picture. Is that changing the game that IP6 IP addresses may be easier to get? There's more of them. Is it changing the deliverability at all in the future? Yeah, well, uh, IPv6 is certainly changing the game. And that's also the reason why IPv6 is not widely accepted yet because there are so many, uh, it is difficult to blacklist um, an IPv6 IP because then uh, a few seconds later, someone would take another IP. So we are seeing now, th that's also the reason why domain reputation is gaining traction. And I expect that maybe when domain reputation is uh, solid, then we will see more uh, IPv6 support with the uh, mailbox providers. Uh, I know that Google, for example, uh, can accept email with IPv6, uh, but they have very strict requirements on authentication. So, so you can only use IPv6 when you have uh, proper SPF and, and DKIM uh, uh, authentication set up. So I, I don't think that IPv6, uh, yeah, it, it's still 99% uh, is, uh, is IPv4 at the moment. Okay. Yeah, um, I would definitely agree. From from my experience, if you're if you're trying to use IPv6, uh, you have to have all the basics in place, and there isn't really any advantage for you as a as a sender or infrastructure operator, except for the fact that you can get more IPv6 addresses. But the disadvantage is that not that many uh, mailbox providers will support it. And in addition, they their their rules would be much stricter. So okay. Uh, okay. they wouldn't enable it. OK, cool. Um, so you mentioned that there are fewer IP4 addresses. So now this might be a very simple, like, uh, beginner level question. Uh -huh. But who owns that IP? So if I come to you, and say, I would like to have my own on-premise infrastructure, do I have to procure, procure my own IP? Or you say, okay, we know the guy who gives the IPs, so you go to this van in the shopping mall and buy the IPs from him. How is this working? Yeah, I, there's uh, basically three uh, models. So um, the, the most common model is when you're a small sender is that you just get your IPs from the hoster. So you host uh, you rent a VM or uh, a server somewhere, and uh, and the hosting provider will will provide you with a public IP. Uh, the same with uh, Amazon um, uh, Amazon Cloud uh, or or another cloud or Azure. 
Uh, you can't send from uh, Google Cloud, by the way. That doesn't work. But uh, on Amazon and Azure, you can. And you will get um, uh, an, a public IP with it. Uh, the reputation of those IPs is not uh, really good. Uh, sometimes it's better with a, a decent hoster. Uh, and often the cheaper the hoster, <laughs> the worse the reputation of the IPs because they have been used before. Um, the second model you will see is uh, when uh, there are people that, uh, that lease or rent IPs. Uh, so when you need more IPs, you can somewhere get, get a range of IPs, rent them, uh, transfer them to, to, to a hoster. Uh, and basically that's bring your own IP. So you, you, you have to have a hoster where you can get, get your, own, your own IPs uh, attached to. Uh, and then the third model is uh, where you actually own the IPs. And that means that you have to become some sort of uh, hosting provider yourself. So you will need to go to uh, the IP providers like uh, RIPE or IANA uh, and do, a, uh, and do a, yeah, an application and become a, even sometimes even become a member. Uh, and that, that of course, costs cost money and effort. Uh, and you have to also justify why you need um, all those IPs. Okay. Yeah, I, I will no. also add to that that it's not as simple as a single IP because uh, the, the IP reputation spreads from a single IP to a subnet, to a net, to an autonomous system. So you could have, uh, you, you can go to a hosting company, get an IP that is... Uh, squeaky clean, but the IP, you know, five IPs next to you, you will have uh, a forum with, uh, you know, sen selling credit card numbers. And uh, in the end, that reputation will trickle down to the whole network and affect you as well. That's why that's why uh, there's, uh, there's a problem with the really cheap uh, ISPs, because if you go to OVH, which is really cheap, you can also bet on having a lot of problems because these cheap uh, ISPs attract uh, a, lo a lot of fraud operators, uh, a lot of questionable questionable uh, subjects, and also because of because of the pricing, they're they're the cheapest. They have the most customers. So they're lacking in uh, in abuse protection, and they just—it's difficult for them to handle these uh, these uh, bad actors and, and get them removed fast enough. I see. Thank you. This is very valuable. And um, um, one more last question. So, if someone decides to have their own uh, on-premise solution, let's say, would you do the review of the IPs what they have? Is that something you do? Because, you know, you said how hard is it to make a difference between the good IP and the bad IP. You also have to look at the neighbors. Is this something, for example, Postmastery offers or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, since the, the IP reputation is that important, uh, we, we often review the IPs uh, beforehand. So when you get an IP from a hoster, especially when the IP has been recycled. So, for example, uh, in Amazon, uh, EC2 and, and the cloud providers, you, you often get recycled IPs. So there have been, they have been used before uh, and you can check those IPs against uh, blacklists, of course. Uh, there are also some sources where you can check a reputation. Uh, and sometimes you notice when you start sending emails from those IPs that you will see uh, 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 deferrals or bounces, errors that, that indicate uh, uh, that uh, there's something wrong with the IP address. So um, yeah, that's a it's a good uh, it's very it's a good practice to uh, check the IPs before you start uh, using them. Great. Yeah. With an with an ESP, you shouldn't worry about this, right? Yeah. We operate. That was going to be my question. <laughs> we operate our own infrastructure. We have our own IP space, and in our case, we are very careful about who we let on our platform. So. Uh, we have very strong vetting processes to make sure that we don't let any bad actors to have an account with us. 
And if some, even a vetted company, let's say an agency that passed the vetting adds one of their clients, when they add the sending domain, we do another layer of vetting. So we check that domain, that history, we operate our own spam threat network to, to see what is going on around the world. And that allows us to, to keep our infrastructure clean. Well, wow, that's amazing. Well, yeah, that, that is great. Maybe it's another uh, presentation verse, you know, how you how you do the back back uh, you know the back end policing. That's that's always fascinating. Maybe you don't wanna talk about it, but maybe it would be a very... lot of it is public. A lot of it is public. Oh, okay. You know, it's <laughs> it's not, not not a problem to to be open about that. Okay. I would definitely not uh, not open up about the details, but generally great. speaking, it's I speak about it a lot on conferences. So. Yeah, that's a great. That's a bit uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges of ESPs is to to uh, be a, a good host and a gatekeeper and make sure that your reputation as a as an ESP as a whole uh, uh, is decent. And uh, yeah, you you have to. Uh, Take care of this. Uh, it's important. Great. So thank you so much. I think we're going to, uh, once this is uploaded, we're going to refer to this video many, many times in the forums because these questions, what you answered in your session, were answered uh, very well. And uh, if uh, anyone has any more questions, then uh, they can find you. We're going to put it in the show notes as well, in the video show notes, your availabilities. Thank you so much for participating. Bye. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye.